Do you want to say a few words or something first or anything? Whoa. Yeah, uh, I, actually, can I can I hold that question for a moment? So, who of you is working on a game? Who of you is trying to sell that game commercially at some point? That's what happens when you close your laptop. <laughs> so basically, everybody is working on a game except for like three or four people, and everybody that is making a game is trying to sell it commercially. Is that kind of right? Is there anybody here that's making games that does not actually want to make a living off of video games? Uh, kind of. <laughs> kind of? Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is there a specific reason for that? Well, it's like, for me, I have like a theory of the latest one is about uh, like a chicken that is also Batman, but I mean, a cat that is also me. And, and I, I want to grow, but I grow them. So it's like, it would be kind of crazy to actually do the game. But I like the idea that I don't have to do it, so I can do it. Yeah. I think about it. It's kind of like my own game that's mine and nobody. It's kind of like the same reason why I play games single player on my own. And I yeah. Like it. Okay. Like yeah. So there are many. There's there are no invalid reason to make video games, right? Mm -hmm. Every reason you can have to make a video game is like go make a video game. I don't care. Um, so most of you want to do commercial video game development. Most of you want to be independents, I guess. In some way or another, like here's the thing: what is independent? Independent, as far as I'm concerned, is you want to make video games, and you don't have 250 people to feed, and or you are one of the 250 people being fed. Uh, anything else is indie, as far as I'm concerned. Like I really, really don't care about the definition, but like you would, you would want to make games on your own or with a small team and earn money, hopefully to make more games. Correct. Yeah. Don't talk us out of it. Man. What? So please don't talk us out of it. Man. I won't. Um, I won't. Um, I will put a little reality check, like in there somewhere. Here it comes. Uh, this is a really, really hard way of living. Uh, it's not. It's not easy. Uh, it requires you to take everything seriously. Uh, not just the game development, also the business. So I was really, really happy to see the. Uh, one dollar, make one dollar uh, game down because that is great. Um, you need to be serious about everything. Um, and you need to understand that independent game development is part artistic, is part personal, is part business. It's both. Uh, that doesn't mean that you should let business guide your design. There's a really specific split in Flander where JW is the designer and our artistic half, and I'm the business half. So I make the business, business decisions, I figure out where we're going with the company. I know how much money is in our bank account. JW actually does not. That's not a joke. JW does not know how much money we have. I don't let him know how much money we have. He just gets a salary. Every month we pay ourselves 1,200 euros, which is not a lot, but enough to make games. It's enough to feel sort of like we're you know, not having everything that we want. We have a small salary. We make games because this is what we love. This is what we love doing. This is what we, we like doing. So we like to make games. Uh, the thing that that does is it frees JW from any worries about money. So he does not have any business considerations. He can just make a game. I look at the game and I go, yeah, this could fit into what we're doing with, with Plan Beer, and then we make the game. Or I look at it and I go, this is shit. We're not doing this. Um, Plan Beer is really simple in that it works on a veto system. Um, so if JW has a design decision, I can argue, and if he says no, then it is no. He's the designer. He's better at design than me. If I had been the better designer, I would have been the designer at Plan Beer. But I'm not. Vice versa, when it has to do with programming, with code structure, or with business, if JW says, well, I don't want to do that, and I do, then it's going to be my opinion that counts, because I'm better at that specific thing. I think that's the sort of trust you need to build. Me and JW, we still don't like each other. I'll be completely honest with you. I will not invite JW to my birthday party if I don't have to. That's fine. I trust the guy. I trust that if he says that this object 
and this object, when they collide, there needs to be like a 2.5 pixel accelerator, like a 3 pixel acceleration on this thing. And that thing has to have like a 2.5 uh, um, frame, a uh, 2.5 millisecond delay before it can move again. I used to program a little slider to check whether he was right. He is always right. So I just gave up. I'm not checking it anymore. I trust the guy. I don't have to like it. The thing is, that is an important, that's an important thing to realize, is you don't have to be best friends. And in fact, it might be better to not be best friends because you can hurt best friends. You need to be comfortable enough with saying something. Yeah, screensaver, that's cool. This computer likes hurting me too. Uh, you need to be comfortable with being honest. Like that's, that's the most important part. And, you need, and this is something that reflects upon a community as well. If you're going to be in community together, you need to be able to look at somebody's game and go like, Nah, not feeling it. No feeling. Has anybody here ever done that? To somebody else's game? Been like, no, this is not it? Would anybody feel slightly uncomfortable with doing that? I feel uncomfortable doing that, but here's the thing, you can give three kinds of feedback. You can give feedback that is negative and hurtful, but honest. You can give feedback that is as neutral as possible. Um, where you don't really pick out anything that really bothers you or really interests you, and you just go like, well, this is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you can give feedback that is aimed at protecting somebody's feeling. The first one is the best one. You can, you can sugarcoat that. You can be like, I hate this game, but the trees look really good. Did you make those? Um, that, that's fine. Like, always find something positive. It's a good, it's a good practice. But break, break things down, because that's the most valuable thing you have. It's about failure. It's all about failure. We're creatives. Does anybody know what 100% being 100% good at being creative looks like? I don't. Nobody does. Like there's no, there is no, there is no measurement. You can't just be like, you're creative. You're like 100%. You're like that. What, what does that? It doesn't mean anything. There is no objective measurement of how good we are. We can only see how good we are if we relate to others. And what we tend to do is find somebody that's better than us and then be like, oh, I'm not good enough. That's another story. The thing is, success doesn't really teach you all that much. All that success teaches you is that this really specific thing worked in the specific circumstances in which it was created with the specific context of that time. It's nice to know that something works. It's not as useful as knowing that something doesn't work. Something that doesn't work teaches you a lot of things because you have to think about why it failed. Unlike success, it's much easier to find things, find where things fall apart. It's, there are a million variables to something going right that all impact it going right. The amount of variables that impact something going wrong tend to be much smaller. You can usually say, this went wrong because I made this decision at that point during the project. That was a mistake. So if you tell each other where you're failing, that's way more useful than telling each other where you're succeeding. That doesn't mean don't tell each other where you're succeeding. Please go tell each other where you're succeeding. Like, cheer each other up. Give each other some motivation. Like, help each other out. But don't be afraid to tell people where they're failing because that's where things get better. That's why a game a month is such a great idea. That's why I do game a week, is because out of 90% of the games I make for game a week, well, 90% of the games I make for game a week are absolutely terrible. 10% of them are, you know, could, could be better, but hey, it's a game. Um, those 90% teach me so much about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Just having to come up with an idea every week teaches me about what I'm interested in and what I would like to make uh, and what I would not like to make. And every time I fail, I recognize a new thing that I probably should not do. All that stuff goes back into Flambeer and then Flambeer, you know, we kind of try and do things that are risky but not completely stupid. Um, although we sometimes do things that are completely stupid. It's nice. Do things that are stupid. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to get better at making video games, do you know the three things you need to do? 
This is a pre. This is a. This is a design thing. Number one, sit behind your computer and make video games. That was easy, right? Number two, don't sit behind your computer. Do other things with your life. Uh, and number three is go skydive. I don't actually mean go skydive. I do mean do something stupid. Do something that you would not do otherwise. Get out of outside of your comfort zone. We're creatives. You know how you get better at being creative? Everything. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Do stuff. Let's, I agree, let's. That's the best, that's literally the best thing you can do as a designer. Let's do everything. If you can do something crazy, like fly out to Ireland, woo, a day after you get the phone call, like this is teaching me a lot. Like being here teaches me a lot. Talking to all of you teaches me a lot. Fucking computer. <laughs> Hit the key every five minutes. My computer doesn't learn anything. Uh, but that's it, that's important. Like do stuff. How many of you have been to major events in the last year? For the people that don't, who didn't go because money? How many of the people that do you say because money have less than $200 savings? That's pretty good. But if you have less than $200 saving, then I guess that's a problem. Uh, if you do have $200 saving, that's exactly the amount of money it would cost you to go to Gamescom from here. Um, uh, trade visitor sticker, 45 euros. Flight from here is gonna be 60 to 110. Hotel, hostel, if you do it cheap, you can get hostels for like 30 a night. So you can go for three days. That's Gamescom, it's the largest it's the largest event we have in Europe. You can go. Why should you go? Because you meet people. What is the most important thing you can do as a, as, as a game designer? Meet people. Why? Because it helps you in every possible way. It helps you with your business, because you know new people. It helps you with PR, because you know the press. It helps you with design, because you learn, you, you meet interesting people that do interesting things outside of your comfort zone, that look at the world in different ways, but have enough points that correlate with you that enough overlap that you can talk to them in an easy way without having to spend the first like month of your interaction figuring out who the hell they are. They're video game designers. They're developers, they're programmers, designers, artists, people like us, musicians, audio people. They want to make games, they're creatives. Talking to them is as easy as saying, hey, what are you working on? And then talk about why. So go to events. Is there any other thing that I really want to say? Oh yeah, why? Why? How many of you ask yourself the question, why? Okay, if you don't, do that more often. Why is the best question you have? It's literally the best question you have. It's a better question than any other question in the world. Why? Good, good. Why? Because why teach you about motivation? We are game designers. What we do is, or developers or artists, or I don't care, we work in games. What is the most important thing in a video game? The player. Why is the player the most important thing in a video game? Without them, there's no video game. Have you ever seen a video game without a player? Have you ever seen a video game without graphics? I have. Have you seen video games without audio? Yes. I have. Have you seen video games without gameplay? Yes. Exactly. You can have video games in every possible way. The only thing you cannot have is a video game without a player because at that point it's just an icon on a desktop or on your Vita or anything else. You need a player. Without that, it's nothing. Except for a bunch of code compiled into something. Um, or cards or whatever. So what is one of the most important things we need to understand of our player? Why do they do certain things? And how can we jump in on that? What, what methods do we have to do that? The question why is like a Swiss knife. It has all the little tools that you need to figure out what you're doing, why you're doing it. Why are you making games? Who of you here have genuinely thought about why you are making video games? Why are you making video games? You're going to die someday and you'd regret it if you did it. Why? 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 So keep asking. 
keep asking, keep asking why eventually you get to the actual answer of everything. It's a really silly thing to do. It's one of the things that, as a kid, you're taught that that is annoying. Somebody gives an answer, you go, why? They give you an answer, you go, why? Then, you know, your parents just go like, really? Like, that is a good question. You know how many stuff we get taught that is completely opposite to everything we do? You know what they teach us when we're kids? Failure is bad. You know how they teach us that? Because they grade you in school. If you don't do what the teachers say, you get a one out of 10. Or a three out of 10. I don't know how your scoring system works. How does your scoring system? Is one out of 10? Uh, okay, anyway, they teach you, do it wrong, get bad numbers, get bad numbers, your life will be terrible because you haven't been gone to school. Isn't that literally what they teach us? If you don't get a good grade, if you don't go to the right school, your life will be terrible. Like I said, failure is the best thing that can happen. All of our life, we've been taught a lot of things that are opposite to what is good for a creator. What is good for a creator? Make a lot of things that fail. What is good for a creator? Keep asking dumb questions. Why the dumb question? Because they're the ones that you're gonna ignore otherwise. Always ask the dumb question. Why do we ask the dumb questions? Because assumptions. Who here has assumptions? Everybody that didn't lift their hand, you have assumptions. <laughs> everybody has assumptions. Just like everybody has prejudice. Everybody has a form of privilege. Everybody has all of these things. There's no way to have none of them. You have assumptions. If you think you don't have assumptions, that's an assumption. <laughs> don't have assumptions. How do you deal with assumptions? By asking, by checking out, by making sure that it is true. How many people... Oh, screw it. Somebody, can somebody turn that thing off? Yeah, I'll turn it off. Can I get the light? Yep. Um, I can also just do like a flashing thing on. Uh, who of you have worked in the Games Press? Cool. In the games press, on the on the media side of things. So, oh, well, that's cool. Where's that little screen? The white room. This is the white room. Um, okay, how many? So, two people. If you have worked in the games press, three, three. All right. So, um, how many people here have heard the story of the? What was his name? The person in the Games Press that got upset because somebody sent them an email reminding them about a news thing they had sent two days before. <laughs> Nobody? Who, think that's a, who thinks that's a realistic story? One person? Okay. Two? Whoa. There's one with badass. Um, that's not a realistic story. Um, it could happen, but it's really, really unlikely. The Games Press writes news. They're interested in news. They're interested in your story. If you have a good story, they want to hear it. You can follow up. If nobody writes about your news, you know what you do? You send it again. The amount of people that don't dare to do that is overwhelming. Because they're like, well, I don't want to annoy the press. I don't want to send them an early build of our game if it's not done. I don't want to waste my chances with the press. I don't want to. I don't want to make people hate me because I keep emailing them. Like, you know how you figure out whether that will happen by doing it. If somebody starts to hate you, whatever, it's one person. Then what? You just find the other person at the same the same site. How many people have actually tried doing something like that? So you want to make video games for a living? Why are you not emailing the press? What? <laughs> so emailing the press is all good, but the thing is like most of the time for you kind of, for example, uh, we're free at home, right? So it's like for very early, yeah. we're kind of considering should we preview or not. But the thing is like we know that doing that will take a week off some of, some of us. Yeah, gone. yeah, same and thing so for me. And the reason for not doing it is like if you do it too early and the game is not good, then it's like they, they probably just won't even bother with writing anything. They'll just start yeah. the game and go like, okay, I think it's yeah. Yep. Instead of making a game, which is what I enjoy, I'm sending emails which I hate. So, yeah. that's kind of why. Right. So, here's the thing I made something called Do Press Kit. It's a free tool, you can use it to make a press kit for your game. It takes about 20 minutes if you have all the assets ready. It's free, it's not MIT free, but it's free. Uh, you don't have to pay for it. To make that, I had to talk to the press a lot, and I asked them. 
what are good things and what are bad things to do. One of the things they said is send your game as early as possible. As soon as you can. As soon as it reflects sort of the values you have for the game, send it to us and we won't write about it. They're like, then why would I do that? They're like, I will check out your game and I will forget about it. The next time I see the title of your game, I'm gonna go like, I heard of that. Where was it? And they'll check it out because they've heard of it. It will be, it will still be awful, and they will play it, and they'll go like, uh. and then you send it again, and they go like, isn't this? Didn't I get an early version of this someday? And they check it out. Then at some point, your game is good enough to actually be written about, and you send them a nice, formal, full email with good screenshots, and you go like. Could you please write about this? At that point, they've been part of the journey of this game for three or four emails over a longer period of time. They will be much more likely to write about it than when you go a few months before release and go like, hey, by the way, video game. They were like, yeah, I get about a hundred of these a day. That's cool. You know how, press, how the average person in the press starts their day? They make coffee. Um, you know what they do while they're making coffee? They check their Twitter. Uh, they check their Twitter, see if anything really important happened. If it didn't, they check their email. How many emails do you think the average person in the press gets when they wake up? I'm talking like the large press. Yeah, it can, it can be something like that. I think the average that we got in, in my questioning was like uh, about 700, six to 700. So how do you read those emails? You don't. Exactly. You scroll through them and you go, this is interesting, this is interesting, I know this person. What is that? Nah. And then everything else just goes archive. So you have about one line to convince press to read about your game. That one line is your subject line. And every, everything else doesn't matter if that doesn't count. You can figure this out on your own. It's really simple. You go, the press hasn't written about my game. Why? It's just that question again. If you keep asking that question about everything, you can figure everything out as long as you don't make assumptions. So ask yourself why and don't make assumptions. Same thing with video games. Don't assume that the player is gonna do something. That's gonna be really funny. If you build a game on assumptions, it will go to hell. It will be awful. How do we make video games? We make something and then we test it. Why do we test it? Because otherwise we're building in assumptions, building on assumptions, means that the player will just take the wrong door and it will screw everything up. A good game has been play tested a lot. A good game has no assumptions. It does make assumptions. It has tiny little assumptions because there's always a part of you that you just put in there. But everything else is tested. You make sure that your game works. Right? Or you just make something silly in two days and whatever. But hey, that's something for two days. If you want to make a commercial game, you need to make sure it works. So, I guess that was me ranting and stuff. Um, let's think. Yeah, let's just do questions. I, I would like to have some questions. Woo! Uh, Duke Press Kid is, is a really good idea. Did you have any connection with the press, or why did you come up with that idea? You're doing a lot of people a lot of favors there. Uh, I got uh, I got tired of making press kits. Uh, that's genuinely the thing. I, I made a press kit for every single one of our games, and um, we make a lot of games. We made 18 games in three years, and after doing 16 press kits, so like, uh, so I made something that automated most of the process, and that would just make it look nice. Uh, so I got a feedback from the press. I just sent them an email with, I'm making this thing and I want to make it freely available for everybody. Could you give me some feedback on how this would be better? And um, actually a lot of them, I think, I emailed 20 of them and I think 16 of them replied with like, oh, this is really cool. Um, this, we, yeah, uh, this is what you should have. And they were like, you should have good screenshots. You should have trailers. You should have a small history of the company. You should have a small history of the game. You should have a description of what the game is in one paragraph. Uh, they had this whole bunch, this whole list of things that they wanted to know. And I'm just like, I'm going to make a thing that just doesn't work if you don't have all of that. Which is what Dupresque ended up being. Instead of being a tool that was made for me, 
based on the knowledge I have of how to deal with the press. It's a tool that just doesn't work if you don't do everything. Um, and that helps nudge developers to thinking about the right question. And that's, uh, I used to think that Prescott was good because it made things easier. And now I think Prescott is good because it forces you to think in a really specific way about your game. And I think that is actually way more valuable than having a press kit. Having people think about how do I how do I talk about my game in one paragraph? I mean, that's a, that's a rough question. I, I for Flambeer, I have a one line pitch for every single one of our games, just in case I run into somebody and they're like, "Are you working on anything?" In like passing by, and I'm like, "Yeah, no, we're making a game about fishing with machine guns." Like that's like enough people will grin at that and be like, "Oh, what what what?" And then come back for a conversation. Like I practice those for days. It's stupid, but you know, how do you pitch your game correctly? Um, our screenshots, taking screenshots of our games, I take like three days for that. Because if I'm gonna, I have like three screenshots on my press kit, they better be the best fucking screenshots of my video game. Because those are the ones that are gonna be in the press. Those are the ones that are gonna be shown to people. So stuff like that takes a lot of time. Um, and yes, that is time that you can't spend on making games. I believe that if you make a game, we establish that a game is nothing without a player, right? I believe that it is my responsibility towards my games to make sure that people play it. And part of that is marketing. So I believe those three days spent are just part of making a game. I don't see that as a separate process. I don't see that as something outside of game development. Marketing a game is part of making a game, at least a commercial game, right? A small game, like a game that you want to make to express something or to, to do a funny experiment. Like, I don't care about it. We didn't market Yeti Hunter. Has anybody played Yeti Hunter? Yeti Hunter was a stupid game we did. It was actually kind of funny. Uh, we watched this documentary about a guy that claimed to have seen a Yeti, right? And Yetis, they're just snow monsters. They 99% sure don't exist, right? Um, the thing is, the documentary was really disrespectful of that guy. It was, it's like they were asking questions and then like superimposing like, you know, all these, these like newspaper articles and headlines with another person claims to have seen the Yeti. And it's just sort of like, it was sort of disrespectful in this really awful way. So me and JW decided to make a game about it. Uh, so we made a game called Yeti Hunter in which you spawn in this snowy forest and uh, there is no Yeti, uh, but you hunt for it anyway because it's called Yeti Hunter. Uh, and it took people six hours on Twitter to figure out that there was no Yeti. Uh, and it was really, really funny uh, because that's the point where somebody did find the Yeti uh, because there was a Yeti in the game. It's just super, 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 super rare. Uh, so that person took a screenshot of the Yeti, posted it on Twitter, we retweeted it and nobody believed it. <laughs> which is exactly what that person in the documentary was about. Like. Which is, you know, that's a, that's a fun thing you can do with games. That's the thing you can only do with games. And we thought that was exciting. I'm not going to market that. Like, that's not part of the scope of that project. Luftrausers. We would very much like to earn money with Luftrausers because we spent two and a half years of our life making Luftrausers. Eight months of a lot of paperwork to get the game on PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita. Um, we have a lot of people that work with us. We have like four people with us. That's a lot for us. We have four people work with us outside outside the two of us, uh, and we would like to pay them money for working uh, because we don't want to be assholes about that. So we need to earn money to be able to pay the money. So in that in that case, suddenly marketing is just part of game development. It's just part of it. You think about it in the same way. You test it in the same way, you design it in the same way, you almost develop it in the same way. It's all, you have a player, somebody seeing your marketing. How will they react to that? Can you test that? Can you optimize that? Can you make it better? It's not that different from game design. It's different, but the big questions are the same. I forgot what the question was. <laughs> Does anybody remember what the question was? You, you, you asked it, right? There was no question. <laughs> I must be dead, Mike. <laughs>
<laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Right, remember, you were going back to you know when you did the game a week. Yeah. And like, how much time? Like, because like, the third scale, what you can do with time in a week. But like, how much time do you actually devote to that one game? So how much time did I spend on games in game a week? Um, genuinely, to be honest, it usually is about six to eight hours a week. Uh, they're really, really short games. They're usually built around something really, really small. They're usually mechanical experiments. Like, can I, can I do something fun with this mechanic? Or something silly about something that happened that week? Uh, I actually formalized game a week a while back. Uh, and I'm the only person in the world that is not keeping to the official rules. Um, the rules are maybe game a week, you're not allowed to revisit an old project. Uh, you start on Monday, complete on Sunday, post on your blog, and uh, do a write-up of why. Of why. Uh, why did you make it, why did, what went right and why, and what went wrong and why. Right, that's, that's the challenge. Um, and um, I don't do the blog posting thing or the, uh, the write-up thing. And um, I guess it's okay if somebody else doesn't do that either. I mean, at this point, at this point, I have to be sort of careful with doing crazy stuff like that before people brand it a Flamber game. Uh, and we don't want that because Flamber games are very specific me and JW. Um, so yeah, with this giant spotlight comes some disadvantages as well. Uh, like not being able to tweet things without being worried that they might be a headline the next day. The eight hours? Usually, yeah, yeah. usually in two days. Uh, usually start on Wednesday or Thursday when I go, oh, fuck, I'm out of time. And then make something that works in like two to three hours and polish it for five hours. Uh, it's sort of a golden rule we have at Flamber. Um, if you have a game jam, traditional game jam, 48 hours, make a game in four hours and polish it for 44. Uh, it's sort of what we found. It's like most of our games are so heavily dependent on polish. And since this is something for which you need the player, you need to communicate everything really, really, really well. Uh, that's the other thing we found. It's like, if you think your cue or hint is obvious, that's about 10% as obvious as it needs to be. But it's just the thing we found. If we go like, this is so in your face, and we just play test it, and people are like, wait, didn't you see the warning? And they're like, what warning? The big flashing one in the top right, they're like, Oh, there's stuff there. Like, yeah, there's like a there's a combo counter. Like it's been there all game. They're like, oh, I didn't see that. That was a big problem with Lufthansa. We literally had to make the thing flash white, just like super, super, like just in your face, annoying white, before people noticed it. It's kind of crazy. Another thing we learned by testing a lot is if you're making an action game, whatever enemy type you have, gives them half the health that they have now and double their number. It's a golden trick, it works every single time. Just don't keep doing it, it becomes annoying. But like, you can do it once or twice, it'll still be completely good. And, and um, make your bullets larger, if you have bullets, and make the game twice as fast, and then toned out until you hit the good point. You never go back to 100%. If you're making the game faster, you're always gonna end up slightly faster. These are only, games that are only tricks that apply to action games, but whatever. Um, they might apply to other stuff too. I don't know. There's actually, that's, that's why Game of Week is interesting, because you learn those things that way. You're gonna go like, what if I just made this game twice as fast? And you're like, this is too fast. How about 150? This is way better. And then you go back through like 10 of your old games, you just go like, what if I make this twice as fast? And it's like, how about 150? And you're like, oh, this is better. And they just keep doing that. And it's like, oh, shit, all of my games would have been better if I just made them twice as fast. Except for the text adventure. That one couldn't be fun. <laughs> just made reading really annoying. <laughs> Next question. Yes. Uh, do, you have, do you know of any good alternatives to Kickstarter for Europe? Because Whew. there's some things that lock it to the USA. Yeah. And I can't get there right now. Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, yes, as in there are methods to get money on the internet right now that are not Kickstarter. Um, no, none of them is as good as Kickstarter. Um, that's sort of the problem. Crowdfunding is, sorry, crowdfunding is fucking terrifying. 
Like, holy shit, that stuff is not cool. It's, it's one of those things where, yes, you have to get comfortable with failure, but here you are, you have a dream, you have a vision, there's a number. If you don't hit that, that's basically the internet going, eh, no, uh, that's, that's terrifying. Like, everybody I've seen go through a Kickstarter that didn't just, like, blast through the ceiling on the first day um, has been terrified throughout the entire process. If you want to do Kickstarter, there are people in the US that might be willing to set up a proxy Kickstarter for you. Okay. Uh, that's the best tip I have. I know there's one in the UK. Yeah, yeah. yeah or in the UK, uh, somewhere nearby. Yeah, just, just, you know, just check with taxes and stuff like that, uh, because that is going to be part of it. Yeah. Uh, especially if it's a lot of money. No, no, I'm not. It's not a huge thing. I just uh, want to get a few projects. May I ask how much is it? Uh, I have to check the prices here in Ireland. I know the price is in Portugal. It was around uh, 10,000 euros to publish a board game. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's not that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's not that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that's something I really like. Yeah, thank you. But okay. not being digital, yeah. shipping is huge. In terms of yeah, yeah, shipping is a problem. And that really scares me. How many of you have ever considered working with a publisher? Okay, good. There's no problem. Um, how many of you have done deals for companies before? Okay, here's the thing. How many of you would think of yourself as not rich? <laughs> good, good. Here's the thing. Companies are rich, okay? It's the thing to remember. The worst negotiations I ever did were for a game that we were doing for Cartoon Network. It was called Dinosaur Zookeeper. They asked us, how much money do you need? And we went like, well, we got 10K for radical fishing, so we'll just ask thrice as much. So we went, 30K. And they were like, okay. That's the worst possible result of a negotiation. Is the other party just going like, oh, <laughs> yeah, of course, we'll do that. Um, that's literally what happened. Um, when you're talking about money, when it's about spending money, please keep thinking of yourself as poor. That's what we do. That's why we pay a small salary to ourselves, because we are really careful with spending money that way. When it's about receiving money, just pretend you're like fucking Microsoft or something. Ask for ridiculous amounts of money. You know why? Because they're not ridiculous. If it sounds ridiculous to you, it's probably still pocket change to a lot of companies. You know Apple? You know how much their game division makes? Like, I don't know, I, I don't even know what the exact value is, but it is hundreds of millions. I asked them, how important is gaming to Apple? And they're like, ah. Like what? Like that? Huh? I'm like, what, what do you mean? That thing makes you like a billion dollars. They're like, yeah, well, we really only use it to sell iPads. <laughs> That's like a billion dollars. They're like, yeah, it's not that much. Like, oh, okay, this conversation is over, I'm out. Um, but that's the way these things go. Like when Cartoon Network is buying a game from you, like you don't have to think about how much the money is to you, you have to think about how much the money is worth to them. Because 30K apparently is change. We could have gone 50 for that and they would have gone like, yeah. So that was pretty bad. When you're negotiating about money, you can usually get way more than you think. Some ways to figure that out, ask developers that have done a deal like that. If you're not sure, you can always email me. I've done a bunch of those deals nowadays that aren't 30K. Uh, uh, we could have used that money so, so well, like early on in the company's life. This was like the fourth game we made. If we had done like 50 out of that, we would have had way more time to work on our game. Um, that was dope. Um, ask other developers, let them set a price point, uh, which is hard. That's a really hard trick. It's like, how do you put the ball in their court? You know how you put the ball in their court? Use something ridiculous as a first offer. Just go, yeah, how about 200K? They're like, excuse me? Oh, is that too much? We're open to negotiating. Like, well, we were thinking more along the lines of like 60. It's like, okay, yeah, we can middle at like 70. We can do that. Like, okay. They call that anchoring. It's a pretty mean negotiation tactic. It's just start so high that in the middle is high. Uh, it's a really, really nice way of doing things. It's, it's something I learned as a computer salesman. It's, if somebody wants to buy a $700 computer, start by showing them the $1,000 one. 
Why? Because at that point, 700 suddenly sounds really, really reasonable. Um, nasty trick, salesman. But hey, that's how things work. If you're going to be running a company and you could get 50k by just being a bit of an asshole, then please be a bit of an asshole. You know how you know you've done good negotiations? The other party got upset at any point. That's how you did good negotiations. Like, I'm just 100% genuine. If you piss off the other side, you're doing it right. Yes. Like, yeah. for example, like yeah. US companies versus European. Absolutely. Uh, negotiations change a lot depending on who you're talking to. Um, so Europe, Europe is interesting. Europe usually has smaller budgets than the US and they have smaller say uh, in, in companies in general. Sony Europe is not that big. Uh, there are some people in there that have a lot of effect on Sony Japan, which actually makes the calls. Uh, so Sony Europe is nice to deal with because they care a lot about this territory, which makes them easier to deal with than, say, Sony US. Sony US has a lot more money, so when you're, when you're going for money, deal with Sony US, and when you're dealing with, uh, with um, influence in the company, deal with Sony Europe, right? Um, the type of people also changes. Americans are sort of these gung-ho negotiators that live in a world of corporate sponsorship, so if you need a sponsor, please go talk to Americans uh, because they have money. Like they have money to spend. They have money to spend on that. Their government does not help them in any possible way. Nobody ever helps in any possible way. So they're all completely used to companies sponsoring companies and companies sponsoring events in like big ways. When we did the Indie Mega Booth, um, we got 60K sponsorship from several, several companies. When I did a similar event in the Netherlands, I had trouble getting fined. Uh, so it really, really changes uh, how aggressive you can be in negotiations. If you're negotiating with a Japanese company, please don't be really aggressive. Uh, be really polite. If you're dealing with an American company, you can basically just drop the mic at some point. Two hundred k. So it, yeah, it changes. Uh, that, that's another thing. If you need money from a company. The way to do that is go to your GDC, find 10 other companies, and pitch. Just try it. I did a VC pitch once. It was stupid. Like, I didn't like, holy shit, that was terrible. Uh, they don't care. Like, it was really funny. They just don't care. I was like, I need, I need two and a half million. They're like, okay, so uh, what's your access strategy? I'm like, I just want to make video games. They're like, <laughs> okay, well, here's our card. Yeah, they would have. They would have loved that. That was the first VC pitch I did. I actually did five or six more. I don't want VC funding. Like I genuinely, I don't. I don't want it. I just want to get better at pitching to them. Because if I ever do need VC money, they won't remember me. There won't be like a file where they go like, "Oh, Rami is my last an asshole." They don't. I've tried. Uh, they do keep your email address though, so I email from a different address. It's fun. Uh, but those are things you can just try, and you can fill out them, because it's completely consequenceless. Like, nobody's gonna like be like, oh, that guy. Yeah, I remember. Like, yeah, Ireland is tiny, but that's why I say go to Gamescom. Uh, if you do that in Ireland, no. Please don't, please don't do that in your own backyard. Like, that's a really bad idea. Find companies you never have to deal with. Yeah, I was going to ask, uh, someone was asking at the back earlier about how you find streaming development and stuff, and how you find that as a company. Is that something you really want? Uh, it's exhausting. Uh, nobody ever realizes how much mental effort goes into both designing and developing games, but also into talking. <laughs> talking actually does take energy. I mean, and that's quite shocking to me, because holy shit, I talk a lot. But, um, Talking and making games at the same time, like it's so great. Um, what is really nice though, and this goes back to the game is not a game unless it's being played, is that our game is being played and we can see that. We can see people playing our game, interacting with it, finding cool, interesting little things. Uh, we've, we're building a community uh, and we're educating people about how games, like one person in, in, the, in the chat, and this is something I mentioned at the GDC talk, one person in the chat completely lost their shit when they found out that bullets in games don't automatically have collision with walls. <laughs> They're like, you have to program that? 
Like, you don't just call it bullet? Like, no, 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 that's not how it works. So you have to, you have to like make it, cool. I'm like, yeah. And then like, it was like silent for 30 seconds. And then I'm like, now I understand why video games take so long. Like, yeah. So it's, it's this really rewarding, exhausting thing. If we're ever going to do that again, we won't do it twice a week with an update at the end of the week. Because more often than not, I'll be at an event uploading a new build. Um, which is not quite what I put. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, how do you find then? I guess like you and JW make such like a, a strong team. I mean, what like one like can you imagine? Can you imagine uh, doing what you do either solo and also you work now on teams, for specific projects with larger like with outsiders. Yeah. How do you find that? And you feel like there's like a magic number of like the people working on projects. Or? The magic number for projects is seven. <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's what I found anyway. Uh, for us, that's that's too much. Uh, that is not an absolute. It might be different for you. As soon as there's seven people involved in something, it yeah. becomes too much for me. Yeah. Also true. If you're ever at an event and you're going to get food with people, as soon as you're more than seven people, food is not going to work out. <laughs> it's just not going to work out because those seven people will attract five or six more people, and no restaurant can seat fourteen. Uh, seven people is tends to be the max for everything where it's still reasonable. As soon as you have more than seven, point, appoint somebody as the person that manages the people beyond that because it just becomes too much. It's overwhelming. We had one point in time where I was managing both Luftraussers and Nuclear Throne, which was 11 people, and it, it, everything fell apart. Like, I just couldn't keep up with all the different tasks and things because they want this, they need this, this person has that thing, and that thing was needed at that point because that point is standing still because they don't have that thing, and this person is waiting for that other thing, and they can't move until this person moves, so this needs to go there first, and that needs to go there as soon as this is there. And it's like, if you do that for two people, it's complex. If you do that for four people, it's a job. If you do that for seven people, it's overwhelming. If you do that for ten, it's impossible. Um, that's my experience. Like, for, for all of these things, by the way, please don't just accept what I say as truth. Like, as you might have noticed, I'm slightly crazy and also an idiot for not taking my own advice ever. Um, there is no right way to make video games. Uh, there's no right way to do any of this. There's a lot of wrong ways, which is why failure is such a great thing. Uh, there are a lot of wrong ways to do things, but if I say anything you absolutely disagree with, please do. Like, please disagree. Figure out whether what you say is correct. If what you said is better than what I said, please email me and let me know, because that might help me out as well. Uh, like, genuinely, like, I'm just somebody that made games and happened to make the right decisions at the right time. And I don't even know if they were the best decisions at that specific time. All I know is that it brought me here and I'm pretty happy with where I am right now. Um, there might be a million other ways to do the same thing. Like this, there is no right way. Please never forget that. Is whatever talk you go to, whatever person you listen to, if you disagree with them, it's 100% fine. Oh yeah, if I can ever work without JW, hell I hope so. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, I, I always imagine Flamber as something that at some point we just sort of hit our feet and we'll just quit. And we'll be like, screw it, we're done. And then 10 years later we'll do a best off. Touristic reunion tour. Yeah, exactly, we'll do a reunion tour. We'll make one more game, give a few more talks, and then just retire or something. No, people, keep, people ask that and it's like, no, JW is the asshole and I'm the smart guy. Uh, and I'm pretty sure JW says the opposite. So. Do we have any last questions then? Uh, mine goes about like fantasy YouTube games. Oh yeah, yes, your question. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, Let's Play is really, 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 really important right now. Uh, YouTubers are really, really important right now. It is a new way of marketing, and it is the only way of marketing, the only way of reaching out to audiences that does not seem to suffer from discoverability issues. Um, and that's weird. Uh, what happens is these YouTubers are really strong personalities first and reviewers slash gamers second. Uh, 
And what happens is that the people that like them like their taste in games. Um, so if you can find a YouTuber that likes your specific style of games, you deal with a much smaller amount of, of competition uh, in terms of mindshare because they only sort of make videos for that type of game in general. Um, so a PewDiePie has like a completely different audience than an Ortho Lion or a Total Biscuit or uh, Sleep Cycles or anybody else, right? Um, I think that that is exciting. I think there is there's a lot in Let's Play and YouTube, uh, a lot of future in there to fix a whole bunch of problems we're having right now because the games press is overwhelmed, too many games. Uh, really specific games press doesn't seem to work all that well. Beat of Patrol is a good example. It's like really specific, interesting, wonderful indie games. And it doesn't just, it just doesn't really take off. So, um, I mean, it's a wonderful website. They do a lot of cool stuff. Um, but getting a niche to make sure that a website can survive is way harder than getting a niche to watch enough advertisements to pay for a YouTuber's salary. So. Yeah. I mean, Valve is weird. Valve is so weird. I don't understand a single thing they do. Um, I mean, I like them. Um, they're by far the most lucrative platform to have your game on at the moment. Uh, even though they're opening up and everything. Like, it's actually surprising. With browsers best sales platform was Steam PC and then the second one was PlayStation Vita. I never expected that because it's also on Mac and Linux and PlayStation 3. Um, Steam is always the best selling one though. Um, Steam is in a weird spot. It, it doesn't really know what to, what to do. Um, they have a storefront that people love with an amazing amount of users. They don't have a team that's large enough to deal with curation. Greenlight is obviously not the solution. Um, opening up to everybody might be a solution, but how do you curate at that point? Um, so I don't really know how to deal with that. Giving everybody their own store page could potentially work, uh, but then how do you make sure that, you know, that remains sort of a safe, uh, legal uh, place? It's something that itch.io itch has interesting problems with. Um, Although HIO has other problems. If you put your games on HIO, by the way, I love that website. I think it's great. It's Bandcamp for video games. It's amazing. Just remember that if any game there ever becomes a hit, you have to do your own taxes for that. Um, that's sort of a big deal. Uh, Steam and Apple do that for you. So that's sort of a pretty big advantage there. Um, but taxes are not a big deal for like the first, first year or so. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, I already asked one, so it's kind of selfish. Well, I, mean, I don't care if nobody else is raising their hand. <laughs> Anybody else have a question? Anybody else that hasn't asked a question yet, ask a question? No? Go for it. Okay. Uh, names for games. How do you decide which ones to capitalize and which not? <laughs> <laughs> um, holy shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we have a few really specific rules for game titles and we've only broken them a, a, once or twice. Um, we capitalize games that we feel are shouty. <laughs> okay. uh, I mean, it's that so Gun Gods is capitalized because it's, yeah, Gun Gods with a Z at the end. Because A, it's a gangster game and B, it's about shanking people uh, and we felt that is pretty angry. So we thought Gun God should be caps only, and then Lufthrausers is hyper aggressive. Mm -hmm. So we thought that should be caps as well. Uh, what? What so the rule for Lufthrausers? No, 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 not a Z. <laughs> no, Lufthrausers is really, really strict. It's like it's real to itself. Uh, Gun Gods is sort of like, I mean, it's it. It's us trying to take gangster rap really, really seriously. Uh, and it was a really fun experiment. We only listened to Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac and. Uh, uh -huh everything for like four months of our life. Uh, after that we were really gangster. And then we just turned back into us when we started working on the next game. It was awful. Uh, but we were, we were pretty big gangster at some point. Uh, 
Good. Cool, okay, and then to, I guess last part to wrap it up. Um, so you talked about, you know, you visit games, communities, kind of when they're kind of yeah. starting to explode and stuff. I mean, uh, do you have any advice on that for, I guess, everyone gathered here today? And then also, what do you kind of, what, what would you look forward to? Or what would you like to see if you were to come back in three to six months? So, here's the thing. Communities are sort of a weird thing, right? What you need, one of, one of you needs to succeed in a big way. That's, that's like, what? One of you needs to make a game that makes people go like, oh wait, shit, there's stuff in Ireland? That's not a mean thing, that's just the way it is. It's like, there are a lot of cities in the US that have a major indie scene that nobody takes seriously because they've just never made a big thing. So, somebody needs to start making a big thing. That might take a while, that's okay. You can help each other though. You're not competitors. I think you all understand that. You're not competing for anything because holy shit, this pie is huge, right? You can all have a slice, that's not a problem. Help each other out. If any of you have good negotiations with a platform or a good contact within a platform or any of that, share that. Um, basically, assume everything is for NDA. So not NDA, fuck NDAs. Everything is between you. Uh, if somebody joins the community, let them in on that, uh, make them part of it, but talk about everything. In Boston, genuinely, the thing they do after GDC, everybody gets together and they talk about every little secret thing that they've heard. Like, every rumor, everything, they all discuss it until they all know it. And who knows, that Amazon was working on a little Android-based, what was it, is it Android-based? I don't remember. It was working on that little TV thing. Like, we've known that for a year and a half, and as soon as we knew that, we told everybody in the building. We're in the Dutch Game Garden. It's a small community, kind of like this, 50 companies, uh, 30 of which make games. Uh, we just had a meeting, and we're like, okay, we heard this from Amazon. And they're like, can we talk about that? We're no. No, you cannot. But we can do an introduction if we ask them. And they're like, okay, cool. So three companies from our building have made games that are launching on that really, really soon. Uh, because they, they had a heads up, because we mentioned it, and vice versa. When Sony started their indie program, we were the first person, the first company to be on PlayStation Mobile. And the reason we were the first company on PlayStation Mobile is because Shahid in uh, Sony uh, UK um, sent an email to, uh, to, to us and said, Hey, I've heard from a bunch of indies here in the UK that you have a really small arcade game that is really, really cool. So I played Super Crate Box and I want that. So you can help each other out, like on a large scale, on a national scale and an international scale. Go to events, especially international ones. If you go to events, don't forget to like bring your community. I'm not saying like bring all the people. I'm saying make sure that you have an iPad full of trailers of every single fucking game that gets made here. Because if you ever meet somebody that's like, oh yeah, no, you know, we're not really interested in in, uh, in uh, a game about a uh, knight on a horse like smashing skulls up into the sky. But what we could really use is a text-based game about spaceships. So you go like, wait, 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 oh, wait, 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 I have that. It's not mine. It's made by a bunch of friends of mine, but I have a trailer. Um, just bring that. Like, if you're going to do that, bring your community with you. Uh, or at least bring the knowledge of that community with you. Um, and the final thing is, meetups like these are so important. Uh, a thing that is sort of predictable, where you're like, okay, every X day of the month there's this, or every this weekend there's this, or at least once a month there's this, is a really, really big deal. So having one game a month here, and having, having this event here, uh, is great. Don't feel scared to have more. Like it doesn't necessarily hurt if you have a thing you can go to every week. It's better than having a thing you can go through every month. Uh, and you can focus them on different things. This feels like a really playful, like sort of mix between playtesting and, and talks. You can do an event that is purely focused on postmortem, uh, which is really it's a really a simple idea, but just one person gets to talk about a project they did and if you get a bunch of, of money or like you can get a sponsor for something like that you can fly people out from somewhere else to do the exact same thing um, and the final thing is uh, is again and this is really simple visibility is marketing uh, also as a community 
you're stronger together than you are apart. So if you need a meeting with Steve, for example, it's better to say like, okay, we have like six companies here that really want to have a meeting with you. Could you make like an hour, like block of an hour where we can just all talk to you? That's way, way more effective than saying, hi, we're a small company, we need 20 minutes of your time. Uh, so your community, you're all doing your own thing, you're all apart, you probably all have different motivations for being here, for making games, you all have different ideas for what games should be, for what kind of games you're interested in, for how you should do things. When it comes to dealing with bigger forces, act as one. Try and act as one, because that will open so many doors. <laughs> if you have any questions, if you have any questions that were either too embarrassing to ask in public or you just forgot to ask in public, I'm around. Feel free to put.